I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Locke now. Dr. Uh, Locke is a urologist in Kelowna. She completed her PhD and residency in urology at the University of British Columbia, followed by her fellowship training at the University of Toronto in functional and reconstructive urology. She has expertise in neurogenic bladder. Dr. Locke, thanks for being here today. I will pass it over to you now. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for having me uh, in your seminar today. I hope that I can give you some information on the effects of Parkinson's disease on the bladder. So the goals of my talk today are to discuss how Parkinson's disease affects the bladder, discuss treatments for bladder issues in Parkinson's disease, and then go over some of the surveillance guidelines, what we do to follow patients with Parkinson's disease and bladder issues long term. So we know that Parkinson's disease is one of the most common um, issues and that one of the most common automatic autonomic disorders is Parkinson's disease. It's associated with different symptoms that you get, whether it be neuropsychological, psychiatric disturbances, sleep disorder, or what are called autonomic symptoms. Lower urinary tract symptoms are the most common automatic autonomic dysfunction. That means 75% of patients with Parkinson's disease do get issues with the urinary tract and troubles with, with peeing. The, these symptoms have a severe impact on quality of life that many of you may realize at this point. And some of the symptoms include overactive bladder, urgency, frequency, as well as incontinence or leakage. So when we think of the brain and how it's important in how it helps you pee, we know that there are parts of the brain, the hypothalamus and the prefrontal cortex that are important in regulating how we pee. We also know that there are other parts of the brain that are important in how we keep urine in the bladder without letting it out, okay? And, and Parkinson's can really affect different parts of the brains in different ways that can have a profound effect on these pathways. So it's initially, peeing is initially um, uh, started from the, the top of the brain and then it goes down the spinal cord to help you either hold the urine in or actually pee it out. Overactive bladder, um, which is a symptom common with Parkinson's disease, uh, originates in the brain. And so we call it de choose or overactivity. So that means when you feel like you have to go, have to go, but you can't get to the toilet in time. That's what de choose or overactivity. The, the muscle of the bladder is contracting without your brain telling it to. And that can lead to urgency symptoms, but also leakage. So when we go back to um, how, how we actually understand overactive bladder and, and how it, help, it fits into the realm of Parkinson's disease, we have a couple of tests we look at in patients to see if overactive bladder is truly an issue. So one of them is to look in the bladder uh, with what's called a cystoscope. And so that's a tiny telescope depicted up to the uh, right of your screen with a little camera there. And we look inside the bladder and we can see from that, um, what does your bladder look like? Does it look like a small bladder? Does it look like a very large bladder? What does your prostate look like? And it's about a two to three minute procedure. It's not painful, but it's uncomfortable. And that gives us a lot of information. The second test depicted next to it is called urodynamics, and that's to test the function of the bladder. So that means we put a little tiny catheter, very, very tiny in the urethra, and we put one in, in the anus, and we measure the pressures when we fill the bladder to see if this the bladder has these overactivity moments, these, these times when you actually have these contractions happening in your bladder. We also can to tell um, what the prostate is doing in, in men. So this test, it takes about an hour, but it is a, a crucial to determine the function of the bladder. So when we think of Parkinson's disease and the, the treatments that are available for Parkinson's disease, we want to know if they have any effect on the bladder and the symptoms that patients have um, with bladder irritation. Levodopa, it's unclear if 
uh, Parkinson's drugs, levodopa has an effect on the bladder. And we don't think it actually has any improvement in urinary symptoms at this point. Again, with dopamine agonists, uh, a questionnaire study reported that voiding symptoms were more common in patients taking levodopa and bromocryptine than those taking levodopa alone, but the data is not that strong, so we don't know if it's actually indeed having an effect on the urinary symptoms. And again, the MAOB inhibitors also have an unclear effect. So in conclusion, when it comes to Parkinson's drugs, Parkinson's disease drugs, we don't think that they improve bladder symptoms. So if I told you 75% of patients have bladder symptoms with Parkinson's disease, what, what can be done about these symptoms? Well, we generally use the, the medications that we use for overactive bladder to treat some of these symptoms. And so we have anticholinergic, beta-3 agonists, and Botox as options, okay? And so when we think of the three categories, the first one are called anticholinergics. And what these drugs do is they reduce the overactivity of the bladder and they increase the size of the bladder so you can hold more. So less urgency, less leakage. They're safe and effective in neurogenic or brain-related overactive bladder, but they do have an increased risk for cognitive-related adverse events. So what does that mean? It means that it can really affect your, your ability to remember things. So we do know when we think of anticholinergics, there are different ones. There are what we call dirty ones and clean ones. So generally speaking, the ones that are less expensive and commonly um, uh, covered by MSP, oxybutynin, for example, uh, has more side effects. So those can have more cognitive issues or memory loss issues. Whereas some of the other medications that are a little bit more refined and they don't actually go into the brain itself can have a better um, um, side effect profile, but they're a lot more expensive. And so those are some of the other drugs that are available. Um, most commonly used drugs we use are tolteridine, oxybutynin, and solofenacin. So some of you might find yourself on one of those drugs. So what about beta-3 agonists? In a study of actually 117 patients with Parkinson's dis disease, that's a good number um, to do a study in this population. Uh, patients were randomized to a beta-3 agonist called merbegron versus placebo. And those that received merbegron had significantly improved urinary symptom scores. And they also, um, they, but they also had trouble emptying a little bit more compared to having no drug at all. Furthermore, in a study looking at that, that worry of uh, memory loss or dementia, they found that the anticholinergic users um, had higher risk of dementia than the beta-3 agonist users. So we think that in patients that are um, men who are, great, or, or, um, less than 75 years, um, and those that are higher risk of dementia probably should have uh, beta-3 agonists. So that's actually, sorry, that's older women that most likely would benefit from the beta-3 agonist over the anticholinergic. So overall, merabegron is, an, is effective in treating overactive bladder symptoms in patients with Parkinson's, and they have an um, acceptable adverse event profile, which is side effects. I will say the side effects of merabegron are um, dry mouth, constipation, and in rare cases, high blood pressure, hypertension. So if I do put a patient on uh, merbegron with hypertension or high blood pressure, I ask them to monitor their blood pressure for a couple of days before they take it and a few days after to make sure that the blood pressure is not rising more than 20, for example. We know that um, it does increase blood pressure by on average five, but that generally doesn't affect many people. So last but not least, there's something called intravesical um, botulinum toxin injections. And so what we do is that cystoscopy with a little telescope, we go into the bladder and we deliver Botox to the back of the bladder. And what this does, it actually paralyzes the transfer of um, some nerve uh, stimulants in the bladder. And this is better than the merbegron and it's better than the anticholinergics at treating urgency and incontinence. We know that, but it is a procedure that you have to go through on a every three months to two yearly basis, depending on how long it lasts for you. And it's not without risk because we know that approximately 80% of patients do much better with Botox. Actually, 29% have resolution of symptoms. 
but there is a 12 and a half percent chance that it works so well that the bladder no longer contracts at all. And you have what's called urinary retention where you can't pee. And temporarily you have to either catheterize yourself or have an, a catheter in for say two to three weeks with that, with that uh, side effect. But there's always a but. So those drugs work very well for the symptoms of overactive bladder associated with Parkinson's disease. But we have to think about uh, men. Men um, are more often affected by Parkinson's disease. They're 0.3% um, prevalence versus zero point, or sorry, incidence versus 0.2%. And we know that it affects uh, people that are older. So in, in men that are older, um, there can also be an issue of the prostate becoming a problem from a urinary standpoint. So if we're using medications and Botox that relax the bladder and you have a prostate that's obstructing the passage, then these men are at risk of not emptying at all or having urinary retention. So with these patients, it's very important to treat the bladder outlet as a, uh, before treating the overactivity. So if we can remove or eliminate the prostate obstructing in the patient, it's uh, before going on to, to treat with these bladder relaxants, then you'll probably get the best outcome overall. So there are different drugs that are available to treat men with large prostates. Alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and what's called the transurethral resection of the prostate, which is a surgery where we core out the inside of the prostate, making sure that it's not obstructive. So I plug this because there are different drugs that are available in terms of the alpha blockers. These are first line treatment options for patients with enlarged prostate. And many men are on these drugs all the time. We do know that there are different types, uh, just like with the anticholinergics, there's different types that are available. We know that terazosin is an alpha blocker used to treat benign prostatic enlargement or a large prostate. And it's discovered to actually <coughs> excuse me, reduce Parkinson's progression in animal models. So perhaps if you have Parkinson's disease and prostate issues, this is probably the best theoretical drug to be on in terms of the alpha blockers. We know in a population of 52,000 men that when we compare different alpha blockers that you could have, that terazosin, doxazosin, and alfuzosin, three drugs, very similar, are better than the one that we often prescribe, which is called tamsulosin, also known as Flomax. And I alluded to some men needing their prostate actually carved out before they go on a medication to help with the bladder overactivity. And so this is um, an example of a transurethral resection of the prostate. So what we do is we go into the bladder with a little telescope and a loop, and we carve out the inside of the prostate that's obstructing the bladder from emptying. And what we find in patients is that with um, uh, Parkinson's disease, there is a, a good chance that you'll do very well if you have this procedure done. One concern is that you can have what's called incontinence from this procedure because in Parkinson's, the sphincter that's, that, that keeps you from leaking may be compromised. But what we actually know in studies is that this surgery works very well and there's a very low likelihood that you'll leak after surgery. 70% of patients actually state they have much better improved quality of life after they have this surgery done. But there's always a but because uh, in Parkinson's disease, there, is, um, there are different variants and extremes of Parkinson's disease, as you know. And there's something called multiple system atrophy. And this is a more progressive disorder. What we know in patients with um, MSA, um, it's, it simulates Parkinson's disease, but it's, it's probably more aggressive. And it also leads to urinary retention in itself. So if a patient has MSA, we really have to think about this beforehand before offering a surgery where you can't pee and you have incontinence because in, in the MSA really affects the sphincter in men. And so if we do a transurethral section of the prostate, there is a good chance that patients with MSA will be fully incontinent after. But luckily, we have that test, we have these tests, the cystoscopy and urodynamics that are helpful to actually determine if patients have um, uh, MSA versus Parkinson's disease. 
So in the back of my mind as a urologist treating patients with Parkinson's disease who have enlarged prostate, I always have to think if MSA is an issue because I don't want to render that person completely incontinent because that will have a profound effect on quality of life. And this is just, you know, a fancy diagram to show what I'm looking for when I look at um, uh, this population to see how I can help them. So this is an example of that uh, Duchuzo activity where we see with the, that test, you can see contraction of the bladder without the brain telling it to. It, it, it shows up on this investigation and we can see that. But in MSA, we also see that the patients don't actually empty their bladder well, and it's probably a, a fact of the bladder not emptying well. So it's important to delineate if a patient has MSA or Parkinson's disease. So last but not least, I wanted to touch on um, surveillance of bladder dysfunction in Parkinson's patients, because we know we should, we should be monitoring patients with Parkinson's disease long-term in terms of symptoms, but also making sure that the kidneys are healthy and there's no chance of infections, those sorts of things. So we actually have guidelines uh, from the urology background. So these are the Canadian urologic guidelines. And we lump all of these disorders and their effects on the urinary tract by calling it neurogenic or how the spinal cord and the brain affect the, the, the urinary system. And we, we use this as a guideline to monitor patients, including patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is a flow diagram where we can actually um, determine if patients are at high risk of having troubles with infections, um, and um, urinary symptoms or kidney failure because they don't empty their bladder well versus moderate or low risk. And I, I'm happy to say that Parkinson's disorder patients often, disease patients often fall into the low risk in terms of um, effects on infection and, and having issues with the kidneys down the road. So if you have urinary issues with Parkinson's disease, we recommend yearly evaluations with the general practitioner the physiatrist, the neurologist, or a urologist. In select cases, for example, in men with large prostates, we would recommend um, having a kidney ultrasound on a yearly basis. And then if they're being followed by the general practitioner, there are reasons we would actually um, ask them to see a urologist like myself. For example, some of these reasons might be new onset or worsening urinary leakage, new um, or, or frequent urinary tract infections. If patients are doing catheterization because they're not emptying their bladder well, if there's any issues with catheterizing, if there's any changes on the renal bladder ultrasound to see that there's some swelling back to the kidney or there's a large amount of urine in the bladder after um, going pee, those are reasons as well as stones to be seen specifically by a urologist. So in general, you should be seeing a doctor once a year and go over some of your symptoms from a urinary perspective. So on that note, I'd like to just go over some conclusions. We know that Parkinson's disease can lead to urgency and leakage. And we also diagnose overactive bladder, also known as neurogenic overactive bladder, based on history, the procedures, the cystoscopy, and neurodynamics. We know that treatment of overactive bladder in Parkinson's disease patients can include anticholinergics, beta-3 agonists, and botulinum toxin. And we have to take a step back and a pause when we have patients, um, elderly men with enlarged prostates, and we should determine if they are um, obstructing because we should be treating that before we treat the overactive bladder symptoms. It's also important to rule out this a more severe variant MSA before offering patients with Parkinson's disease surgical intervention or that transuther section of the prostate for enlarged prostate. Parkinson's patients with bladder dysfunction should also have yearly evaluations and possible renal ultrasound imaging.